welcome all my key friends to this Good Friday series of meditations on the last sayings of Jesus. It's a time honoured uh, in the Christian tradition to look at the seven last sayings of Jesus from the cross in a kind of composite way of putting together all the various sayings from the four Gospels. And I've chosen to do it this way for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because I think it helps us to appreciate the multifaceted nature of the cross. And secondly, because it helps us to understand, I think, as well, a progression um, through the hours of Jesus' experience on the cross as he first of all talks to his disciples and his mother and then to finally to God. So that's why I've chosen to do it this way. And um, I am totally in debt to my friend and colleague Bridget McCauley who has allowed me to use her images and many of her prayers um, in this in this meditation it's largely her work just with a little bit of me in it so I am in great debt to her uh, for allowing me to do this and I will put a link to her website and to the vessel trust that she founded um, where you can find more meditations along the same lines and some of the images that I'll be using. So, um, as we go through these seven sayings, there is something that I suggest that you are attentive to, and that is to if any one or two of the sayings has particular resonance for you in some way at this time, it may be that God is saying something to you and your circumstances through these sayings. So it would be great if you could be alert to which of the seven sayings, or maybe more than one, seems to uh, find a place in your heart. So here are the seven sayings. The first one is, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing and they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. It's no surprise that forgiveness is at the heart of the cross. It is a universal human experience that just by living and interacting and behaving, we wound one another and the need for forgiveness is ever present. It's one of the great reversals of the cross that the violence that is meted out towards Jesus is not um, returned with more violence or words of hatred, but with forgiveness and compassion. So I wonder, are there areas of your own life that you'd like to bring into the light of God's forgiveness? Perhaps you might make the sign of the cross on your forehead, the kiss of God's forgiveness. Lord of the Cross, we offer you our fragmented, unfinished understanding of what happened on the cross of Calvary. We want to experience the hope of the cross in the world's need at this time. We long to see its power crossing out the evil and fear around us. We need to see your shining, forgiving presence in the dark recesses of our own souls. Your cross marks the spot the place where humankind meets God. Here light shines in the dark, and the darkness has not overcome.
The second saying is, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. One of the criminals who was hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I wonder what you make of this exchange between Jesus and the two criminals either side of him on the cross. It's often been said that the, the two criminals are kind of representatives or paradigms or examples of the various different ways that people can respond to Jesus. On the one hand, mocking and deriding and rejecting him and on the other um, an acceptance and a sort of quiet instinctive uh, understanding of who Jesus is. They've also been seen as kind of polar opposites or poles um, and, and that we move between these different poles. But I think um, I want to just focus on that word remember because Jesus says it in a strong sense of the word, as he does um, when he says to his disciples at the Last Supper, remember me, it's the same Greek word. And it means kind of, it has this sense of um, bringing back together, remembering um, an event from the past into the present with great starkness. And so when the criminal is asking Jesus to remember him in paradise, there's a deep longing to bring um, the present of Christ into the past of Christ, that event into his present moment. And I think that's again another universal longing. So what tensions are you experiencing at this time in your circumstances or your relationships? Are there ways in which you feel pulled in different directions? How are we to hold these tensions? Perhaps you could try sitting quietly with your two hands open on your lap. Hold the tensions you feel before God in prayer. The third saying is, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, sister Mary, the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. So this third saying is the second of two bits of dialogue uh, that Jesus engages in when he's on the cross. And this time it's to people that he loves and who love him, to his mother and to the disciple John. And we can see again clearly, uh, even in his pain and his suffering, Jesus's regard for others um, in his tender kind of making sure that both Mary and John are cared for after his death. And so I wonder what words of comfort and compassion do you need to hear from Jesus now? It may be helpful to slowly make the sign of the cross touching your head, gut, arms and heart in turn and placing yourself in the presence of Christ of the cross who 
who remembers us, connecting us to himself. I will stay present in the darkness. I will seek the strength to stay with Jesus. I will try to turn my gaze from my pain and the pain of the world onto the Christ who fell under the weight of our darkness. I will look at him even though he scandalizes me as much as he inspires me. I will gaze up at him even if he seems a stranger to me in this half light. I may no longer be sure who I am, but I choose to trust that I am held and carried in the love of God, as the grain of wheat is held and carried in the wet earth. This stranger God has stayed beside me in the dark, and he is with me in the light. He has called me his child. That is who I am. He is both love dying and hope rising. The fourth saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima Sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so with this saying, we see Jesus turn inward. How do you imagine that he said these words? Do you think he might have said them quietly? Or perhaps with a loud cry? We know that Jesus is echoing the psalm, Psalm 22, in the depths of his pain and abandonment. And indeed, Psalm 22 is riddled with despair. But if you read it, and I suggest that maybe that's something you could do, if you read all of the Psalm 22, you'll see that the writer also calls for God's assistance hasten to help me, he says. There's a longing in it for reassurance and hope. Many times we feel that we have been abandoned by God, I think. Those of us with faith, it is a universal experience that God at times feels very far away. The Psalms have been called 150 things that God doesn't mind you saying to him and I think with this cry and much has been made of this cry of Jesus my God my God why have you forsaken me we understand that he feels a profound loss and there are depths very human depths to his sense of abandonment and pain it seems that at the present time we are surrounded by death and dying and loss in all its forms. We have daily updates on the number of people that have died in the world and in our country due to coronavirus. And we know that people have lost their livelihoods and the economic consequences of this virus will last for some time. People's plans, their parties, their celebrations, weddings, graduations, holidays have had to be postponed. And um, all around us, so many of us are affected in so many ways from this virus. It is a universal human experience, a loss, how we deal with it. And yet we find here at the cross, yet again, an experience that Jesus knows and understands. Are there particular areas of loss that seem to be close to you right now? 
be been surprised also by any new shoots of life that have come at this time. Ask that God would bring to life and fruition the seeds that have fallen and been lost in the dark earth of these present circumstances. The loss of contact with friends and family or support services can be serious loss for some people and for those particularly with mental health issues. And so let's pray for those who are plunged into fear and anxiety at this time. saying is I thirst. After this when Jesus knew that all was now finished he said in order to fulfill the scripture I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. For this saying, I wanted to concentrate on Bridget's picture that she has painted here and what she says about it. So I'm just going to read that. She says, this painting seeks to express something of the moment of Jesus' death, both its finality and its hope. The sun is darkened and bears the mark of the cross. No part of the created world is unaffected by the terror and the triumph of Christ at Calvary. The curtain is torn, revealing a mysterious space. The place where God dwells is now accessible, but it is an awesome place, the Holy of Holies. Dare we enter in and risk getting lost in this presence? Dare we trust ourselves to this God who is so full of mystery and yet, at such cost to himself, is revealing his purpose? tearing down the barriers and calling us into deeper relationship with himself. Gold indicates the transcendent presence of God. In this image, he is present in the figure of Jesus. This figure can be seen in different ways. We may see Christ as actively tearing open the curtain, a stance of great authority. Or we may see him as utterly vulnerable and small, slipping from the cross in death and falling into the earth's darkness below. Perhaps these are both fragments, pieces of understanding of the cross of Jesus, and the gold shines at the edge of the torn curtain, right at the heart of the painful tear God is. And so the prayer that Bridget has written, God of mysterious darkness and revealed light, you have opened your very self, that we might come to dwell in the Holy of Holies. You have slid to the depths of human suffering in order that no experience of ours is outside your presence. You are with us in the torn places of our lives. Your loving, healing presence is light in our darkness where the world is ripped apart by war and famine, injustice, loss and fear and by a global pandemic. You are present in the tear and in the tears. We offer to you our shattered, hurting world. We give you our broken, incomplete selves as you were torn. Mend us and make us whole.
the six saying, it is finished. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. For centuries, Christians have thought about and written about and debated what the it is in it is finished. And you may have your own ideas and your own thoughts on that. One thing is clear is that something has been happening and going on on the cross for it to have been finished. And so Madalena and Anna are now going to sing a song about that. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns his face away As wounds which mother chosen one Bring many sons to glory sin upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until To your hands I commend my spirit. Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, 
Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. In these final words of Jesus, his focus is on the Father. The work of the cross is done. Through Jesus we see the Father. God shows that through his crucified and risen one, violence, pain, sin and death cannot fill up the whole space of the world. And there is no place God is not willing to go, even to death. for our sake and for our salvation. And so a final prayer. Forgive us, Lord, when we have domesticated your cross and made it serve our own ends. Thank you for the many faces of the cross that challenge us and comfort us that both disturb our peace and bring us hope. Help us to face both the suffering and the glory. Help us to live creatively with the tensions of the cross and our present circumstances. May we see you stretching wide your arms, making yourself a meeting place. May we too be bridge builders, bearing witness to divine glory in earth's rough humanity and carrying in prayer the needs of a broken and fearful world into the transforming, renewing heart of God. Amen. And so my friends, I hope perhaps in the rest of this day you might open your Bibles, you might look anew at one of those sayings, that you might sit with God and let God speak to you and your present circumstances and the circumstances of the world. For we know that we are held in all things and at all times by the outrageous never-ending and unfailing love of God.